It's good to be back. I heard uh, Lynn did a great job last week. Amen. Glory to God. He, he, uh, 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 I've listened to the sermon and I remember the name. Was it, what was the name of his sermon? Big Man, Little Man. How, how come y'all remember that? Because he's a big man? No. He actually said that in the sermon. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm picking on him. But it's a good word, amen? amen? You need to take that to heart. Humble yourself and seek Jesus, and Jesus is going to meet your needs. Amen? I, I love the scripture that he used in there. It says, with man it's impossible. With God, all things are what? Possible. The book of Hebrews is an extraordinary book. It's really a book about worshiping God. It takes us from the pattern of the Old Testament worship all the way through New Testament worship and understanding that the ultimate sacrifice was Jesus Christ. He is the high priest. He's moved by, your, by, by, by what you feel. Amen? Amen? He can sympathize with you. Amen? But let's look at verse 1. We've been going over this. This is some of our key scriptures on this series I'm doing on praise and worship. Today we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant a little bit. It says, God who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past. Say times past. So he spoke to us, to our, he says, to the fathers by the prophets. He also spoke to us through the law, which Moses was a prophet who brought the law. So he spoke to us through the old covenant, and he spoke to our fathers. But I like this. He says, has in these last days, say, say last days. Last days is the new covenant. So we know that in the Old Covenant, God spoke to us in different ways and in different times. He used the law. He used all the stories. We, we can see all of the law and the prophets and what they said. He was speaking to us, revealing Himself to us in the Old. And guess what? Every one of the Old Testament fathers had to respond in worship to God by faith. That's, God was always looking for them to simply believe Him. But He says in these last days, under the New Covenant, this covenant of grace, this covenant of Jesus Christ is under the, in these last days has spoken to us by His Son. Now we need to know the Son, don't we? The Son of God came to reveal grace and truth. Say grace and truth. Say thank God for grace. Say thank God for truth. So He began to reveal to us the truth of what all was being said in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, is the Word of God concealed. It's kind of in types and in shadows. The New Testament is the Word of God revealed. So when Jesus Christ comes, He opens up the whole Word of God, and you can begin to find Jesus from the beginning of the book all the way to the end of the book. You begin to see that the animal sacrifice that was taking place in the Old Testament was actually a picture of Jesus. When they were offering up the Passover lamb, that Passover lamb was a picture of Jesus. And over and over we see those pictures of Jesus all the way through the Old Testament. Types and shadows, we call them. And he says, in these last days is spoken to us by a son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the worlds. Do you all realize everything was made through Jesus Christ? Well, let's pray to the Father in his name right now. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And we truly want to become worshipers of our God. Not worshiping idols. We're worshiping you, the one and true, the only true God, your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, let your anointing touch every heart, every mind, every person in this place today. May we never be the same again, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So all things were made through him, and we're going to look at a couple of little scriptures. In verse 3 it says this, Who being the brightness of his glory... Now, Jesus is the brightness of the glory of the invisible God. That's what he's saying. So as God went through time, he began to reveal himself in the Old Testament to our fathers, through the prophets. But in these last days, has shown himself to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And he says, Jesus Christ is the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, say purged our sins. Some of us say, hallelujah, my sins are forgiven because of Jesus. But you've got to believe it. You've got to receive it. Amen? He took the sin of the whole world on himself, but your sin is not forgiven until you believe and receive the sacrifice, the provision that God made for you in his son, Jesus Christ. So it's not automatic. It's to those who believe. 
That's why the scripture says all things are possible to him that believes. Not all things are automatic. It's possible. So you got to believe it and receive it to the degree that it changes you. Amen. It begins to change the way you think, changes who you are. All of a sudden, you, you begin to have convictions about certain things that you never had before. Your heart becomes soft. Amen. That anger you used to have, now you're convicted for that anger. Amen. See, when I grew up in Bayou Blanc, we, we'd steal something. We didn't feel bad about it. That's just how you did in Bayou Blanc. If they left it outside in the front yard, it meant you could use it until you wanted to bring it back. And then you get saved, and all of a sudden you realize the Word of God says, Thou shalt not steal. Uh-oh. So the Word of God reveals to us truth. And thank God that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. So when I hear the truth, guess what happens? All of a sudden I realize now I shouldn't steal, but God's got grace to help change me from being a thief into being someone that's going to be a blessing. Y'all see that? So the more you learn about the Word of God, there's more that's going to be required of you. To them that's been given much, what? They love much, and there's more required of them. So the more you learn the law, the more you're going to realize you need grace. See, if you don't know the Ten Commandments, then you don't know how much grace you need. When you learn all of the Ten Commandments, then you're going to realize you're going to need more grace because you realize you can't keep them. Do you realize? I mean, that, um, that's the truth. And so the more you learn from the Word of God, you know there's more that God requires of you, so therefore you need more grace so that you can live for God. Now get that. He's not saying you need more grace so that you can have a license to sin. He says you need more grace because grace is going to enable you and empower you to live free from sin and to keep the law. Now get that. And that's worship, because you believe what God says, and therefore you adjust your life to be a doer of the Word of God and not just a hearer only. If all we do is keep hearing the Word of God and we don't change when God, you know, deals with us through the Word, through the law. See, the law doesn't save you, but the law lets you know you need to be saved, but grace saves you. So you need more grace. Say more grace. More grace. I'm always needing more grace. You know that song we sing, I Need You More? Yes, grace is a person. His name is Jesus Christ, by the way. Amen. Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. You can't, live without, you can't just have grace without truth. But when you have the truth, you need grace because the truth is good. The more you're going to look at the truth, the more you're going to say, I can't do all that. I need grace, God, so I am who I am by the grace of God. I'm saved by grace through faith, that not of myself, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. So I can't boast about keeping the law, i got to boast about the grace God's given me so I can overcome. I can be delivered. How I many I know God's grace will deliver you? Amen. If you have an addiction in your life, guess what's going to deliver you? I, I thank God for the 12-step programs and all those works that we do, but let me tell you, it's going to be the grace of God working through any of those things that's going to deliver you. Amen. It's always going to be His grace. Because grace is what? God's what? Unmerited favor? But it's more than that. It's His divine enablement. It's Him saying, I bless you even when you don't deserve to be blessed. But your faith has to access the grace. That's in uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. We access His grace by faith. By faith we access His grace in which we stand. So I'm standing in God's grace. And so the more I learn about Jesus Christ, the more I realize that He's a God of grace and truth. And I'm so grateful for that. So again, he revealed himself to us through the law and the prophets, through the prophets in the Old Testament. And as he would reveal himself, we had to respond to him by faith. Because God's looking for our faith. Amen? Amen? Faith, responding to him in faith is actually obeying him. Because you believe him. Then in these last days, he's revealed himself through his son. So Jesus Christ is trying to show us, uh, you know, how to walk in grace and in truth. Go with me to Acts chapter 15. These are the key scriptures that I've been building this sermon series off of. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. 
Now as, and, and this is jumping off of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says that he will pour out a spirit on all flesh. Well, well, let me read it. I don't want to misquote it. There's two things. He says in verse 8 of chapter 1, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the mission, the Great Commission, is for them to take the Word of God to all the earth. So as we're going through the book of Acts, we get to chapter 15, and Peter has been now preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Say Gentiles. Now, we have, we have such a mixed group now, so many new people. How many of y'all in here do not know the difference between a Jew and a Gentile? It's okay if you don't understand that yet. Who doesn't understand that yet? The Jew and Gentile. The Jew were the chosen people of God, that God was revealing all of these things through, like the, when we talked about to the fathers by the prophets. He was talking to Israel, to the Jewish people. But in, his, in these last days in the New Covenant, he's revealing himself to all people. We're the Gentiles. The Gentiles are everyone else but besides the Jews. Amen? Every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. So he's wanting to include every person on the planet in his plan. And so what happened in the book of Acts, they started in Jerusalem where the Jews were. And in Judea, that's part of the Jewish community. And Samaria, that's where it was the half-breeds, they call them. They were half-Jewish and half-Samaritan. And then he says to the other most parts of the world... He reaches out to the whole world. And that what happens is the Holy Spirit moves upon Peter and people come to Peter's, or where Peter's at and he goes to Cornelius' house and he preaches to a group of Gentiles and while he's preaching the word of God, it says the Holy Spirit falls upon all of them and they all begin to speak with other tongues just like they did in the beginning. And he said, who can forgive these to be baptized because God has chosen them? Now, the religious people, the Jewish people, they were under the impression that for people to be saved, they didn't only want them to believe in Jesus, they also had to keep the law of Moses. We've already covered some of this. I mean, we're here for some of that. So we kind of want to build up to where we are. And they even would get mad at Peter because Peter would eat with the Gentiles. And they would get upset with him because they wanted the Gentiles to, to become Jews, not just Christians. And so when we get to chapter 15, this whole situation gets dealt with by the apostles. And in verse 1 it says this, And certain men came down from Judah and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Somebody say, that's a lie. lie. Y'all realize there's scriptures in the Bible that actually teach us what a lie is? You can't take that one scripture out of its context. I'm getting my sword. Because unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. Who's first? But can you imagine how abrupt that was to, to them? They're preaching the gospel about Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, about Jesus Christ who's full of grace and truth. But the Judaizers are coming along, that's what we'll call them, or the, the, the ones that are still wanting the law to be mixed with grace and truth, what we're talking about. And so he, they're saying, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. And so they said, well, I think I'm going into another religion. Now, for the Jewish people, it was a normal thing to be circumcised because most of them were circumcised on the eighth day. Now, when you get circumcised on the eighth day, it's not as bad on the 58th year. <laughs> now, some of you guys will never forget this sermon. That's why I did that. this down. And listen, they got an argument over this. It says, therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small uh, dissent or dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Philistia and uh, Samaria, describing 
the conversion of the Gentiles. Describing the conversion of the Gentiles. Peter kept telling the story. I preached at Cornelius' house. The Holy Spirit fell and God chose them and they were converted. So they kept just saying the same testimony over and over again. And there was great joy and, uh, to all the brethren. You know why? Because that meant all could be saved. And see, so we're going to get down to worshiping in a little bit. Because what, what we're going to get down to, just to set you up in verse 16, it says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. And the tabernacle of David was, was a tabernacle that was open for all to come to the Ark of the Covenant. So God is including everyone. Every one of you is able to be saved. There is no sin you can commit that, that God will not wash away except the rejection of Jesus Christ and what He did. You walk away from Jesus, then you don't get to be uh, redeemed by His blood. And the Holy Spirit is drawing you. So when it says to sin against the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is revealing to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for your sins, that He was buried and that He was raised from the dead, and you still don't want to walk in that truth. You'd rather walk in your own truth. And these Judaizers are wanting to walk back into the law instead of walking into grace. It says, so being sent on their way by the church, they I read that already in verse 4. And when, they came, uh, and when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, they, they believed in Jesus, the sect of the Pharisees, rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now they're not just talking about circumcision. They say it is necessary to command them to be circumcised and to keep the law of Moses. And see, this shakes up the church right here because some, some people in church, they say, yeah, we, we're saved by grace, but we still have to keep the law of Moses. The law of Moses it should be taught to you so that you know that you need more grace. And when it's taught to you, it's not for you to break it, it's for you to see it. Man, without His grace, without His power, without His Spirit, I have no way of keeping this law. I need grace. So why go back to circumcision and the law? And Peter's going to say a little bit further. Let me just read it. The Word of God says it clear enough itself. So the apostles and elders came together and con to consider this matter. And when there had been, no, had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren... You know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That they should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Not circumcision and the law. The word of the gospel and believe. What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and how he paid the price for the sin. That he was the Passover lamb. And we can keep expounding on it. That all of what the Old Testament law and prophets was all about was about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's not about religion. It's not about the law. It's not about circumcision. It's about what Jesus did. He kept the law for me and for you. And so whenever he lives on the inside of you, he enables you to what? Keep that same law by his spirit and by his grace. He blesses you. He empowers you. To not commit adultery. He empowers you not to steal. He empowers you to worship only one God. He empowers you to honor your father and mother. But religion back then, even, even back then, some of the religion was saying this. Well, if you give all your money to the temple and everything, you're released from having to obey the commandment to honor your father and mother. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, you're taking your tradition and you're making the word of God of no effect. By your tradition. And verse 8 says, So God, who knows the heart. I love that, right? Underline that. Who knows the hearts of people? God. Come on, somebody say it better. Who knows your heart? God. Who knows my heart? God. Some people think they know other people's heart. They don't. They don't know your heart. I used to be around some people that were so super spiritual to act like they could read my mind and, and know everything that was in my heart. No, God knew my heart. And they used it to control me. 
and they would false, use false prophecies and say things to me to try to control my life. I was, at one time I was in a church that you didn't even want to buy a car until you got permission from the pastor. He wanted to know how you were spending your money. That was like 20-something years ago. You do not want to be in a church where the pastor wants to control you. You want to be in a place where the Holy Spirit will control you by you allowing him to. He won't even control you unless you say, yes, Lord. But that means Lord. If if he's the Lord of your life, that means he's Lord. And he becomes king and Lord. And you obey him. You follow him. You do what he wants. I can't hardly control my own life, much less control y'all's. Amen? In fact, I can't control my life. I need the Holy Spirit. I need God's grace. Because you'll find yourself out there. How many of y'all blew it every now and then? Thank you for the three of y'all that told the truth. The rest of y'all just blew it by lying. We need him, that's right. And, 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 and listen to what he says right here. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them. He acknowledged the Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. So Peter says, this is how I know that, that he chose the Gentiles, because I saw God acknowledge them. God knows the heart, and God gave them the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of y'all in here have the Holy Spirit? If not, get a hold of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because it's a different experience than just being born again. It's being where the Spirit of God comes upon you. And I, I, that's not my teaching today. Whenever you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. But whenever you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God comes upon you and empowers you and anoints you so that you can fulfill your mission in the earth. When you got born again, the Holy Spirit moved on the inside of you. You're going to heaven when you die. Your destination is taken care of. But if you're ever going to do something for God in the earth, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You need to have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because without that, when you wake up in the morning, you don't have no motivation to get up and pray and to do devotion and to say, God, where am I going to go? Am I going to go here or there? You, you need the Holy Spirit to prompt you. He'll put a hunger in you. You getting anything out of this? Look at verse 9. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying, purifying, listen, their hearts by what? Faith. Keeping the law. Faith. By circumcision. Faith. faith. Say faith. faith. Our response in worship to God is one thing. To believe Him. Amen. To believe Him. He purifies your heart by your faith in the finished work of what Jesus Christ did. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. And thank God He's the heart purifier. Yes. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm glad God's still working on me. And verse 10, he says, now, therefore, why do we test God? So he's saying, you guys that, that want to go back to circumcision and the law, he says, you're testing God. Why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear, or I'd say keep? So he said, we're having this big discussion and you want them to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, but you can't even do it yourself. I can't. Our fathers couldn't. You can't. They're the ones that really got salvation because they got it by faith in Jesus Christ and faith in Him alone. So they're having this argument. And these Judaizers, these, these disciples from Jerusalem, still want them to go back and put the law on the Gentiles. And they're determined... Peter's determined not to right now. So they're still arguing about this. Sounds like a church meeting, isn't it? Look at verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Wow. Circle that. Put stars around it in your Bible. This should be a mantra or or, or, a slogan for our church. We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as the Gentiles are, as they. So why go back and bring them back into the law? 
He said, we couldn't keep it. So we actually need to be more like the Gentiles than we are. But you know what? Paul was willing to become all thanks to all men that he might save some. Because later on in the book of Acts, which is strange to me, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Paul about it, they circumcise uh, one of his disciples so that they could get into one of the synagogues because they couldn't get into the synagogue without him being circumcised. He didn't circumcise him to be saved. He, circumcised him. he got circumcised so he could ac have access to more people to preach the gospel. Do you, so that, that's all I can figure from that. But that's pretty strange that Paul actually, and, and I forget who it was. I, I'd have to go a little bit. It's a little bit further in the book of Acts. I didn't, I'd encourage you all, read the book of Acts right now. It's just so, so rich. With what I'm teaching, you're going to see so much out of it. Your eyes are going to be open to it. Amen? So the whole deal here is we want people to come to know the salvation, the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. But see, when we as church people go at people with the law, guess what? They're going to look at the law and they're going to say, there's no way. When you go with Adam with your church doctrines, they're going to say, I can't do all that. You go and say, well, you can't wear pants, or you, you can't cut your hair, you can't wear makeup, you got to wear long sleeves, you can't, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. Guess what ends up happening? They say, well, I won't. But whenever you teach them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and say that it's by faith in Christ, and then let Jesus, let the Holy Spirit do the purifying of the heart, let the Holy Spirit do the changing of their lives, now, the Holy Spirit will use one another. How many know that iron sharpens iron? That's part of the Scripture. There's accountability in the body of Christ. That accountability comes out of relationships so that we can grow in the things of God. But in the, in the midst of that, there still has to be grace, amen, and truth, and there needs to be mercy. Now, I want to be careful about saying mercy right now. Because you cannot always overlap mercy and grace, and I'll get into that a little bit later as we're teaching. Because you know what grace is? God's unmerited favor is divine enablement in his life, in your life. It's him empowering you to be blessed. And mercy says you don't get what you deserve. But you got to remember that be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he's going to also reap. Amen. So there's a principle that's working there, but still whenever you do something, you still want God's grace. Amen? Amen. To enable you to be delivered and you want God's mercy so you really don't get the punishment that you would deserve. But people have taken the two, I'm going to say it this way, when you take grace and mercy and you lump them together, they take it for a license to say they can do whatever they want and there's no consequences to it. It's wrong. It's a whole other teaching. Did y'all kind of get that? That's a little teaser. All right? So there's no license to do what you want. But guess what? There's grace to deliver you from the things that have you in bondage and there's mercy that will hold back the judgment until you get delivered if you're looking to be delivered. But if you're trying to have grace and mercy for you to have a license to do what you want, you're in trouble. You do not understand the grace that Jesus taught about and that Paul taught about. That's good right there. Somebody might have wrote that down so I can remember it. <clears throat> so where am I? Verse 11, yeah, that, that, that's what I say, a slogan. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved just in the same manner as they. And then it says, then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Paul, I mean to Barnabas and Paul, declare how many miracles and wonders God did, uh, God had worked through them among the Gentiles. It says, and after they had become silent, James, who was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, he was pretty much the leader at that time, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, as it is written. And he's going to quote out of Amos chapter 9, verse 11. After this, I will rebuild, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. The tabernacle of David. Say tabernacle of David. And I will rebuild its ruins. And I will set it up. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. So he said we're going to take it out of the 
the, the, uh, the uh, tabernacle of Moses out of the law, and we're going to bring it out into the open so that all the world can come. That's the picture here. The tabernacle of David was just one tent that the Ark of the Covenant sat under. The tabernacle before that was the tabernacle of Moses where they had to go through all of the religious rules and laws to get into the holy place to offer up sacrifice to the Lord. Now, under the tabernacle of David, the sacrifice that's going to be offered up to the Lord is what? The fruit of our lips praising Him. That's why we have praise and worship. The tabernacle of David is how we're supposed to be worshiping God in the New Testament. That's why what we're doing here is not something new. This has been there since David's time. Amen. We just have more electronics and we have, you know, different type music. But guess what? They played on drums and on, on, on cymbals and stringed instruments and trumpets and all kind of instruments. And they played 24-7 around, the, ta around the, the ark. So what he's saying here, he says, in these last days, he says, I'm going to raise up the tabernacle of David. We need to become a worshiping church more than we've ever worshipped before. Y'all want to see some miracles happen? Y'all start worshiping God. Yeah. The way we say it in Bayou Blanc, petli, cut loose. Yeah. Worship God. Be free to worship God. And, and like I was saying, and, and I don't have a lot of time to get there, but uh, he says, and he says, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all His works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. But that, uh, it says, that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and things strangled and from blood. He says, for Moses has had throughout many generations, those who preach Him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. He says, we hear about Moses' law every Sabbath in the synagogues. He says, but this is the only thing I want you to tell the Gentiles they need to do. These are kind of the only little rules they're giving them right here. And they say it twice in this chapter. In fact, let's jump down. I'll show it to you again. Look at verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than this necess these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols. See, what was going on in this area, they would offer up animals to idol worship, and they would take the animals, and then they would bring them to the meat market, and they would sell the meat, and, and people were saying, well, we can't eat that meat because it was offered up to idols. It's like idol worship. When, it, when Paul says, I will not eat meat again because it's going to cause my brother to stumble, it was meat that was sacrificed to idols. So he said, okay, don't eat the meat sacrificed to idols. And then he says this, because it's, it, it's touching on idol worship. Paul gets more into that than in some of his writings, where he says that we know the idols is really nothing, but to their conscience it is something. So therefore, because they're consciously thinking we're worshiping an idol with this meat, we might not eat their meat. He said, but to you that have faith, you can go ahead and eat the meat, but eat it to yourself. But don't eat it in front of a brother who thinks that you're worshiping a false god. Did y'all get that? Amen. That's what he's talking about when he says, do not eat meat if it's going to cause your brother to stumble. And he says, and from blood. In other words, we're not supposed to eat blood. Blood is supposed to be poured out on the ground. Y'all realize that? Amen. In fact, a good hunter, when he kills an animal, what you supposed to do with that animal right when you kill it? Supposed to cut it and bleed it and let the blood flow into the ground. Right. Amen? Amen? And from things strangled, because they were offering up animals to their false gods by strangling them, and the blood would be in the meat. And we know by scientists, scientists tell us that blood in the meat like that makes the meat not as good as if you bleed it. Right. Amen? Amen? There's some fish that way too. You know, you don't want to, uh, 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 what, 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 what kind of fish you like to bleed? When Where are some fishermen in here? A catfish, you cut it, bleed it, get that blood out of it. I mean, the meat's better. A shoe pick for sure. If you eat shoe pick, God bless you. And it says from sexual immorality. That's quite obvious. If you're not married, you're not supposed to be having sex until you're married. Now, that's heterosexual sin and homosexual sin. 
That's the truth. So you know what? Get married. If you, if you burn and you, you want to have sex, marry her. Marry him. Somebody say amen. amen. I did it. Amen. And I'm happy that I did. And it says, if you keep, it says, if you keep yourself from these, you do well. Farewell. That's all that they put on them. Not circumcision, not the Ten Commandments, not the Law of Moses, not animal worship again. And see, when we get to the book of Hebrews, guys, when you start reading it, you need to read your scriptures. When you start reading the book of Hebrews, what you find out going on in the book of Hebrews is there's still a bunch of people that want to go back to animal sacrifice, back to temple worship. And therefore, when it says that they trample underfoot the blood of Jesus, they're talking about you don't want to accept just what Jesus did. You want to add to what Jesus did, and you want to go back to the old way of doing things. Go read it in its context. Context is important in the book of Hebrews. Because people take a few little scriptures out of there, and they use it to scare people to death, like they're going to lose their salvation by reading a couple of those scriptures in that, chap in that book. Amen? But he's talking to the ones that are going to that, that say, no, Jesus' sacrifice wasn't enough. I want to go back to the law and even back to temple worship. Amen. We're not going backwards. We're going forward. Amen. Amen? Amen? And I can't wait for Jesus to return so that we'll actually know everything the way we need to know it. Because yeah. until then, guess what God does? He uses people like me, imperfect people, to preach a perfect message. And in the midst of it, I, I'm, I'm a piece of dirt, by the way with a spirit and a soul in it. So when the pure water of God's word flows through me, it might get a little bit muddy. But God works in the midst of the mess that men make because he's God. Jacob, will you come? So I want to lay this foundation because where we want to go from here is to see that we're going to see the tabernacle of David, what David did to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And I mentioned this to the men last night. He danced before God with all of his might. Say his might. his might. I talked about it this morning. When you worship God, it takes your own strength. Amen. But God wants to anoint your strength. God wants to anoint your worship. It's like speaking in tongues. Some of y'all will say, I want that gift of speaking in tongues, but I'm not going to do it until the Holy Spirit does it through me. He's not going to take your tongue and start waggling. He's not going to be like, oh, and then you're just going to be possessed by the Holy Spirit and you're going to start speaking in tongues. You actually have to start speaking in tongues by faith. You lift your hands by faith. Amen? You bow down by faith. You lay hands on the sick by faith. Amen? You prophesy by faith. It's all by faith. God is looking for us to just believe Him. But the first thing is, are you still stuck under the law? Are you still stuck under some religious tradition that has you held back where you say, I, I, I don't know if I die right now, if I go to heaven or not. You know, my religion says this and that, and, you know, my, this pastor said this and that, and, and you're looking at everything else but the simplicity of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, he says, he will bring with him those who believe that. That means they died believing in him, and they're with him. The jailer, when he asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? He simply says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your house will be saved. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8, for I am saved by grace through faith that not of myself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is your faith believing what God did for you on the cross. He let them nail his hands and his feet. He let them put a crown of thorns on his head. They pulled his beard. They beat him. They put stripes upon his back. And he did it because he loved you. And he who knew no sin when he was raised up on the cross, he says, if I'll be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. He who knew no sin became sin for you and me that we might become the righteousness of God. Let me give you a new term, and I want you to meditate on this as we continue in this series. 
Faith righteousness. What you need to have is faith righteousness, a righteousness that you have by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you. Faith righteousness, not works righteousness. Because your works to God is filthy rags. You cannot work good enough to get to heaven. As I was preaching yesterday at, at, a, uh, at a memorial service, a bunch of bikers, a bunch of people that needed to hear the gospel. I mean, it was an amazing day. Tony and Ann was there. Stacy was there. A lot of people were there. And, uh, you know, that we have this thing in our mind that there's this scale. If we do enough good deeds, we go to heaven. If we do too many bad deeds, we go to hell. We got this scale. There's no scale. The way it really works is whenever you came into the world, you were born with this thing we call original sin. The sin, the weight of sin was so heavy on you that no matter what you did, you could give your body to be burned, you can give all your money, you can do everything, and all your good works does not lift that sin weight up. All man's good works becomes filthy rags. It does not move the scale, of not an iota, not an inch. But when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ says, I take the sin of the world and your sin personally upon myself, that weight is gone. And I give you the gift of righteousness. And it does this. I mean, you are totally 100% made perfect in your spirit. You're totally saved. And if you die, you go to heaven by faith in what he did for you on the cross. And you're not saying, God, I'm, I'm standing for you. I got to get into heaven. St. Peter, let me in. My name's in the book because I did this and I did that and I did that. No, he's going to say that's not good enough. He's going to say, who do you say Jesus is? Amen. That's the answer. But once you got that righteousness, you should do works of righteousness. Amen? Amen. That's when you have his grace to walk the rest of this journey out. That's when you renew your mind with the word, where you get your heart healed. Amen?